Underwriting for the production of Auto Lime this week has been provided by. Auto Line is brought to you in part by the commercial vehicle brands of Tenneco, pioneering global ideas for cleaner air and quieter, smoother, and safer transportation. Ford Warner, developing advanced technologies specifically aimed at reducing emissions, increasing fuel economy, and improving performance. Our award-winning innovations extend from turbocharging and cooling systems to friction materials and diesel cold start technology. Built on a century-long reputation of innovation and reliability, we have the track record that proves our technology can help meet the challenges of the commercial truck and off-highway industry. Deloitte's Automotive Group is at the forefront, driving transformation and tackling complex challenges. Whether you are interested in globalizing operations, optimizing supply chains, mitigating enterprise risk, or driving innovation, Deloitte can help develop solutions that create long-lasting value. To learn more about Deloitte's Automotive Group, visit us online at deloitte.com backslash US backslash automotive. Here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. You know, we often talk about the light car and truck market on the show. Today, we're going to change that up a bit. We're going to talk about the commercial truck market in North America. And I've got three experts joining me on the show to discuss it, including John Rupert, the general manager for the North American Fleet Lease and Remarketing Operations at the Ford Motor Company. Rich Shearing is the president of Penske Commercial Vehicles. And John, John Blodgett is the Vice President for Sales and Marketing at McKay & Company, which is a consulting and market research firm that covers this area of the business. And I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. Pleasure. Thanks thank for the you. invitation. John Blodgett, let me start with you. Uh, what is going on in the commercial truck market right now in North America, the U.S. in particular? Give us a quick update. Well, uh, the market's good. Sales are up. Uh, they've been up the last couple of years. We're expecting another strong year this year. Uh, the economy is doing well, and that's what drives commercial vehicle uh, sales. You've got to have the vehicles to move the freight. And when we're all comfortable with the economy, we're out buying products and goods. We need trucks to move those. So uh, it's been a, a good good few years for the truck market. Rich, uh, I know you've only been at uh, Penske Commercial Vehicles uh, since February of this year, I that's think. Correct. Is that right? Yeah. So, But you're not new to the business at all. all. You, no. You've been following this. How do you see the commercial truck side going? Yeah, I see, see it similar to John. I mean, there's been... Uh, a steady recovery, and it's been uh, nice and easy for everybody to keep up with it from the engineering side, the manufacturing side, the supplier base as well. So um, I think the carriers themselves, uh, they would add capacity if they could get drivers to, to put behind the wheel. And um, being on the dealership side now, you know, we've had some stability in the technology. Yes, there's been some, some environmental um, regulations imposed, but uh, those haven't been as drastic as, say, they were in EPA 07. And, an EPA 10, and that's allowed uh, us to have some stability in, in the product, which has improved the durability. So all around, very good. And I want to get back to that talent uh, okay. issue in a little bit later in the show, but uh, John Rupert, yeah, how do you see the commercial market going at Ford? Yeah, so it, it, it's healthy. It's healthy, and, and of course, we reach down to that Class 1 vehicle on up all the way through Class 7, and, and the interesting thing about that is there's growth in every segment, and, but more interesting than that is the greatest growth over the last two years has been in the van segments. So that's a little bit unique, and there's more participants in that segment and new products in that segment, new technologies in those products, and I think that's driving the growth that we're seeing. Without getting into too much of the details, you mentioned from class one to class seven, there's actually eight classes. Right. As you know. Run us through that a little bit quickly. Yeah, well, what so, are these different classes? So I think the easiest way to describe it is class one would be your smaller vans, a Transit Connect, the new Nissan NV200 is a, is a class one product. And then if you reach all the way up through class seven, that would be a medium duty truck, something you might see on a tandem man, so uh, a dump truck or a, a package delivery truck, box truck. And then of course, class eight reaches up into the tractors that pull the tra tractor trailers over the road. Yeah, John Blige, seven and eight, are, those are the big semis, right? Right. Uh, class seven would typically be a single axle tractor, class eight, or, or a straight truck. Uh, class eight would be a tandem axle tractor or straight truck. 
uh, class eight's 33,000 GVWs and above, and uh, and class six starts, I think, 26,000 and above. So. And class six, that would be what, like uh, the FedEx, UPS uh, delivery vehicles? Yeah, it's basically the largest truck you can you can rent from a, a rider if you're moving on the weekend uh, without, without getting a, a CDL license, but uh, yeah, big box truck or something like that. And, and Rich, what kind of trucks do you guys deal with at Penske Commercial? We're in the four through seven, and so you know you look at any commercial vehicle. So there's a, we support the Thomas uh, built bus brand, um, Freightliner Sprinter vans. Those are in the class four through class five. Uh, M2 product is a Freightliner six seven product, and then class eight you'd be in the Freightliner Cascadia or, or, or the Western Star nameplate as well. And these are, you're selling these, you're renting them, to explain what you, what you do. So we have uh, 16 locations around the U.S. and uh, some are parts and service only, some are parts only, and then some are what we call full, full service locations where they're actually wholesaling or retailing the new vehicles, class four through eight, as well as providing service to the customers that we sell and transient customers that may be coming across the country, um, as well as the um, used equipment as well. And. Uh, with all these uh, trucks that you're dealing with, you, you mentioned that sales are going pretty good, mm -hmm. and the economy, of course, has got to be a big driver. What else is going on that's driving this market? I know, I know in times past, and you mentioned the different EPA levels. I think you said EPA, what was it, 2008? Seven and, 10, and 10, 2000. Yeah. I know when new uh, emissions regulations come in, they can drive up the cost of sure. those trucks. and. And people go out and buy them before that price increase goes through. Absolutely. Are we seeing that now, or is this just pure growth? No, it's pure growth, and I think and I think John would would support this comment. I think because there was so much pre-buy for those two regulations emissions that you you mentioned to avoid some of those those cost increases, um, they they kept they brought more vehicles than they actually needed at the time, and so then the market obviously declined. Right. Um, they weren't getting the utilization out of those vehicles. And so now in order to get a return on that investment, they're keeping them longer. And so what we saw in, in the last couple years that now is resulting in a lot of new sales that we have is, is the pent up demand due to the average age of those vehicles climbing. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a combination of, of that as well as the economic growth that we're just seeing in the general economy combined, um, those two things are driving up business. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. I mean, with, with the recession, slowed down the economy, People didn't use their trucks as much. They, you know, they didn't weren't pushed to buy new trucks. But now, when the economy picks up, right. there, uh, you know, there's pent up demand there to to replace some of these older trucks. Plus, the, the economy requires them to have new trucks. So, you know, John, I was going to say, John, the other yeah. thing that's that's happening too is as the advent of driver convenience technologies, driver um, uh, safety technologies, and and. Uh, uh, they're 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 accelerating the purchases because there's, these products have, you know, particularly on the van side of the business, have not typically had those types of technologies. And now with the advent of all this new product, I think it's and, and the and what it means for cost of operation right. um, is driving uh, accelerated demand, if you will, for in those segments. So. Mm -hmm. What's with all the European styled commercial vans we're seeing here? Ford with the Transit, odd. What is it? Uh, at Ram, they have the Ducato, I think it is. Which I is think the ProMaster. The, the ProMaster, yeah. exactly. Uh, I think back in the Daimler Chrysler days, that's where it all started with the Sprinter coming yeah. in, which is now still sold by, yeah. uh, by Daimler. Yeah. Why all these European designs coming over to the so, U.S.? So for us, it's really about kind of that uh, leveraging the one Ford plan, which is, you know, reaching uh, for platforms that we, that we sell globally using our knowledge of the marketplace here and our knowledge of the marketplace in Europe, bringing them together. Uh, it's a product that's built here in the U.S., but it's on a global platform. So there's the powertrains are unique to this market. So it's it's kind of the best of both worlds. You're using global knowledge, global uh, expertise, but bringing a, uh, a a product to market here uh, that can serve the customer's needs better than we ever have before. And it's a terrific product. I, yeah, I, I, I drove the Transit. I could not believe how well it drove. And yeah. you know. I'm a, a hardcore car enthusiast. I love fast sports cars. Right. I couldn't believe how well that right. that van drove. Yeah. John, what do you? Why do you think? I mean, I, I understand Ford saying, "Why should we have two separate vans? Let's just do it." But why do you see us seeing more of the European design vans in the U.S.? Well, I, the, the people who buy those trucks are also impacted by the cost of operation. So you know, the fuel and so aerodynamics. Uh, some of the, the Sprinter with a diesel engine helps uh, you know save them money in those types of applications. Larger cube space. 
it just makes good business sense uh, uh, for those those types of applications. And Rich, you spent time at Daimler. You, you yeah, must I mean, have been heavily involved with the Sprinter. Yeah, I think um, you know none of the OEMs are going to bring a product to market if there isn't a market to support it. And I think you have to look um, back at uh, consumer spending habits. And I think more and more now the consumer is spending a lot of more time purchasing things through the internet. Mm -hmm. And um, typically, you know, the the bigger trucks are moving more of the the durable goods for manufacturing and the, the smaller vans are moving more of the consumables and so I think the the shift in online purchasing is really driving a lot of the van uh, market activity from my perspective yeah. anyways. So more deliveries to people's homes yeah. than yeah. have taken place in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Does, does this prospect of Amazon looking at using drones to deliver packages scare you guys? It doesn't scare us. No, I think I think we're a long ways away um, from having that technology be robust enough to to, to replace uh, delivery vans. Uh huh. Uh, so we, we've talked about the, the vans, John Blodgett. What are some of the other hot segments in this class one through eight? Um, segments from the standpoint of sales. sales. I mean, what, what's where do you see things shifting, or do you see things shifting in the commercial v truck market? Well, we, we've seen uh, uh, certainly Class A's doing well. Trailers are another portion of the commercial vehicle market. They've been strong. Um, we're seeing a little bit of a drop off in Class 7 vehicles, where people are either kind of moving up to Class 8 or down to Class 6 or below uh, in certain applications. Uh, when you get below a Class 7 vehicle, you no longer have to have a commercial driver's license, so it sometimes makes it easier to recruit drivers, which is it's an issue across all those all those segments. So. You see it that way too, Rich? Yeah, and I also see the, the used market being extremely strong in the last couple of years. You know, the, the, the na big national carriers that you, it would be more visible to a lot of people in the marketplace, you know, their, their trade cycle is anywhere from two to four years. And um, they have the capital to be able to purchase the new equipment and reduce their overall operating costs uh, by getting on the new technology. You look at the the, the traditional owner operator or the smaller carrier, they don't have access to that capital. And so they wait a little bit longer to get that new vehicle. And invariably what they're doing is, is taking a more measured, slower approach to adopting that technology. And they're more in the used market. So we've seen the used um, truck market be extremely strong the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And John Rupert, how do you see it? Other, other than the, the vans, yeah. which are doing pretty yeah, good I for you guys. Not to dwell on that topic, but I, well, we're, we're watching real closely with the, with the variations that the vans bring to the, to the marketplace. Will there be any migration out of traditional pickups with caps or bodies on the back of a pickup that now the van offers for more utility, you know, walk-in space and things like that? So we haven't seen a lot of that yet, but we haven't been in the market that long with our medium and high roofs. So, you know, segment migration, I guess, is what we're what I would would suggest that we want to monitor closely. And then the other thing is, you know, the alternative fuels and and what what engines are going to power these commercial vehicles in the future and what is that alternative fuel of choice if there is one I'm not sure there will be but well I'm glad you raised the topic uh, we've done shows uh, here on AutoLine about CNG compressed natural gas LPG propane for powering commercial vehicles what do you see going on out in the market yeah so um, you know in terms of just a percentage of the total it's still a relatively a, a niche market albeit um, the the particularly CNG and propane is plentiful. It's uh, it's inexpensive relative to other choices, and uh, there is a there is a part portion of the segment that that requires alternative fuel in their in their uh, RFQs, uh, their their bidding activity, if you will. So um, we uh, we've developed products with CNG and propane capable powertrains. We prep the engine properly so that if the uh, if the customer needs that, the engine will be durable and robust throughout its life cycle because of that uh, unique uh, things that we're doing to the engine. Rich, do you have customers coming to you asking for alternative fuels? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we just delivered uh, 64 tractors to Dean Foods in Houston. Um, they had, they had took a, um, a foray into that business three or four years ago and um, had a very positive experience with it and are, are migrating there in certain segments of their business uh, faster than others. I think, um, you know, when the, the price of crude is where it's at right now and the payback, yeah. you know, with the uh, incremental you know, costs is, is not quite there. You know, John mentioned um, certain markets, it's certainly more feasible than others, you know, captive 
fleets where they're coming back to the same location every night, refuse, there's a lot of adoption there. It still is a very niche market and I think the, the uh, interest uh, kind of wanes and comes based on um, the price of crude and uh, the technology that's available. But uh, there's a lot of people still experimenting with it and dabbling with it. And uh, compressed natural gas versus propane, do you see anyone emerging as a clear winner there? Yeah, we're seeing more compressed natural gas. There are limitations, um, at least on the bigger equipment, is the range that you get relative to diesel. You know, a lot of those big rigs will carry 120 to 140 gallons of diesel fuel and they can run five, 600 miles before having to fuel up. Because you have a gas, it's not um, as dense and you can't get as much um, length out of haul. Right. And so um, that's a challenge for these guys. And then you need uh, a fast fill station uh, when they do need to stop and that takes longer than regular diesel fueling stops. So it's, uh, there's still some challenges, but I think a lot of uh, great companies working on those challenges and we'll continue to see some growth in that segment, I think. The other challenges that fleets have in the commercial vehicle market, most of the fleets do the majority of the service work themselves. So it's not just whether I buy a, a, a natural gas powered vehicle or diesel powered vehicle, just based on the fuel, it you know, makes sense to go for the natural gas powered vehicle. There's an additional cost for that vehicle, quite a bit more, but you also your technicians have to be trained to work on natural gas vehicles and your maintenance facilities have to be vented and all sorts of other regulations mm -hmm. for that. So it's not just the, uh, the switch from uh, a uh, natural gas powered vehicle to a diesel powered vehicle that they have to consider. Yeah, it uh, sounds to me like we need the price of oil to go up again <laughs> by a lot before that ever catches on. Yeah. I think that discussion is centric to commercial vehicles. Just one of the things that, that those vehicles, the types of vehicles we're talking about, you can package the, the, the containers for the fuel. I mean, on a light, light vehicle, it becomes much more difficult for weight as well as just package space. So under the frame rails, under right. the body, what in the body. Um, so I think as as the technology and CNG propane have evolved, it's been centric to commercial vehicles for that for that yeah, reason. Because they have so much space, exactly. like you say, yeah, to, yeah, to put those yeah, extra yeah. tanks in there yeah. and big ones. So uh, John Blodgett, uh, I, I know v I'm very familiar with what the light vehicle industry faces in terms of fuel economy regulations, corporate average fuel economy of 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025 and zero emission vehicle mandates and the like. What is the trucking industry, the, the commercial end face? Uh, well, they've had the EPA requirements that we were talking about before, 2007, 2010. Now there's uh, greenhouse gas uh, rules that are coming up. So that'll be looking at more ways to help get that miles per gallon up for the vehicle. So less, less carbon on the vehicle. So aerodynamics, uh, things that they can do with the, the engines that have less resistance in the engine, tires, less rolling resistance, pulling the tractors closer to the, the uh, the trailers to help that gap between there. Um, you know, off the end of the trailers, you'll see more, if you go down the highways, you'll see more tails, we call them, on the back of the trailers to help uh, reduce uh, um, uh, the airflow that causes the vehicle to, to burn more fuel. So a lot of that's going on. Yeah, uh, and Rich, this has got to be adding cost to vehicles too, but uh, what do you see coming with this uh, greenhouse gas standard facing the commercial industry? I think you really just need to look at what the Department of Energy is doing with the super truck program. And that program, a lot of the OEMs are just wrapping that up. In fact, uh, several weeks ago at the Mid-America Truck Show, several of the OEMs there were demonstrating you know, what they had done for that program. And that was a joint effort with the DOE where the manufacturer matched the, the contributions that DOE had to demonstrate 50% freight efficiency. And that's a little bit different than fuel economy, but um, it, it's where you're looking at the complete vehicle now. Now, wait a minute. What, what do you mean 50% freight efficiency? So you're looking at how much weight can be moved and how efficient the vehicle is at moving that weight versus just a pure fuel economy metric. Gotcha. Um, and so... And, and the 50% means what? 50% improvement over oh, where they that's were. That's huge. Like, yeah, it's huge. Um, but most of the manufacturers, uh, as a part of that program, being able to demonstrate it. Now, they've demonstrated with technologies that aren't ready for manufacturing in, say, the next two years. But I think in the mid-2020s, a lot of the things that were demonstrated, whether it was hybrid drives or um, waste heat recovery systems, those are technologies that absolutely will come, I think, in the mid-2020s. And, uh, and I think what, is, what they're looking at now is no longer the tractor separate from the trailer and no longer the powertrain separate from the aerodynamics. As John mentioned, it's, right. a, it's more of a holistic Total pack, approach. Total yeah. package. I would say similar to a, to a CAFE standard on the, on the automotive side. I had no idea. 50%? Yeah. 
That's big. And and John Rupert, what are you guys well, working I, I on? I guess in that what's regard? unique to us is that because we cross over the over 8500 versus the under 8500, you know, they've kind of they've come forward in at different times and in different ways and and the company's committed to work, you know, collaboratively with with the administration and and uh, get on a glide path to to meet the standards. Yeah. Uh, so Kind of everything that we're seeing in the, the light vehicle market will be applied on the commercial truck side as well. Yeah. Is light weighting a particular concern? Because on, on light vehicles, that is. But if you're carrying all these things, does light weighting play as much of a role with commercial trucks as it does in light vehicles? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's part of the, that there was, I would say, three or four different aspects of the, the super truck program. It was light weighting, powertrain efficiency, aerodynamics. Those were the, the main pieces of the puzzle. And light weighting, obviously, is absolutely uh, a key, key component to it. I know we're hitting a lot of topics, but I'm learning a lot listening to you guys. Rich, you raised the, the issue before of the trucking industry having a hard time getting drivers. Right. What's going on with that? You know, it's not the most desirable profession, I would say. Uh, you look at the number of hours that those operators are away from home. Um, you look at what's going on in the oil fields and the amount of money that can be made there. Uh, construction and um, housing starts is up. And so a lot of the people that would traditionally be in trucking have other avenues um, to make money and be home with their family more often. So I think um, those are the bigger challenges that the industry faces right now. Yeah, John Blodgett, what, can you add to that? Or? No, he's exactly right. I mean, uh, but even when the economy was slow, it was hard to recruit drivers. And when the economy comes back, especially when construction comes back, those, there's yeah. more likely to go for those jobs. I think uh, you're starting to see more progressive fleets start looking at ways to keep their drivers out less time and maybe do some more uh, slip seat type operations where the truck goes from point A to point B and then the, and the driver may switch trucks and mm -hmm. come back to point A and somebody else takes over that truck. So he's not gone as long, more time home with the family, you know, hopefully able to attract more folks to, to that, that segment. Mm -hmm. John Ruper, do, do you guys look at this Yeah, we, we, we don't look at it too much just because we're not in that class eight segment with the products that we're selling, albeit uh, uh, we are up through class seven. Um, I will say that some of the larger fleets that we have that have, uh, you know, uh, the package delivery f uh, fleets and things like that, where while they may be not overnight, there's a lot of driving involved, they're facing the same problems. Getting people to commit to living a life behind the wheel of a vehicle is not the most right. uh, desirable uh, occupation. Rich, others have said, isn't the solution just pay them more money and they will come? Certainly, I mean, that would, would help. I mean, uh, money always talks, right? But I think there's a, a fine line there to um, having a sustained workforce um, that would be willing to do that profession. But it is an issue. I, I mean, I've, I've heard truck fleets uh, be complaining about this for some years, and mm -hmm. it, it seems to be a broader problem in the economy anyway, not yeah. just with truck drivers. That's right. But yeah. All companies complaining about not being able to get the talent that they want. Mm -hmm. right. uh, John Rupert, what I find interesting is Ford Motor Company has some heavy truck operations in Brazil and China, I believe. Right. Uh, I want to say Class 7. I don't know if it goes up to Class 8. Right. Or? We, we, uh, we sell uh, a Class 8 vehicle in the uh, South American market. And again, the, the, the unique thing about one Ford is the sharing and the collaboration that happens across these different uh, functional operations. And, and uh, so we're, we're constantly looking at whether or not there's a, an opportunity to bring that market here or one of the commercial products that we have there in, in other, parts of the, other parts of the world. So it's a, it's, a, it's a valuable thing that we've got. Wasn't it about a decade, decade and a half ago, Ford was importing trucks from Brazil? We were. CL900, was right, that the, right. the one? We were in that business. And uh, uh, of course, w what we're really excited about right now with our 650, 750 product is that we are uh, getting ready to launch our all new product built in Ohio with our powertrains, and that's uh, uh, a migration away from our joint venture with Navistar. So uh, we're excited about you know Ford design, Ford built, Ford powertrains, Ford workers. That you know kind of that the whole vertical. And those had been built in Mexico. Before, yeah, they had that before. Right? That's right. Since uh, 1998, I believe. What was the the thinking behind moving that back to the U.S.? We seem to be hearing about everything going the other yeah, way. Well, so. uh, it, you know, unlike the other manufacturers in the class six seven segment, our product tops off our our lineup. It's at the top of our lineup, where most of the other manufacturers in this segment, it's their entry-level product for their Class 8 offering. And so, again, uh, Class 1 through 7, 
Um, the reason we're in that business is for the volume that, that that product represents, but even a greater reason is that the adjacency sales that come with it. Uh, we've done the research of somewhere between six and eight vehicles are, are adjacently purchased to every medium duty truck that's sold. So when you kind of do the quick math, uh, while well, we may save 16 to you know 20,000 units on an annual basis if, if we continue to deliver our share, there's 100,000 units of something else that these customers are buying. So it's the power of choice for a customer, one-stop shopping with the Ford brand. So if I understand this right, somebody comes in and says, hey, I need a Class 7, and, and I'll take some of these F-150s and that's a couple right. of Transit Connects. And that's I right. mean, that's literally well, how it works. Just the, the desire to, to, to deal with one manufacturer, one manufacturer's representative on the vans they need, the light-duty pickups they need, and that one or two medium trucks that they may need to round out their fleet. Uh, we, we're able to do that. In fact, we're the only manufacturer that's in Class 1 through Class 7. Adjacent sales. I'm going to have to make a mental note of that. I've never heard that's that term before. Oh, boy, yeah. very interesting. So, Rich, looking forward, how do you see the business going? Yeah, I think John touched on it a little bit. I think we're going to see, certainly this year looks strong. Um, we're having a great year, a great start to the year. Um, we think next year is going to be um, similar, at least uh, flat, no decline. And then, um, you know, then we're going to be getting into uh, the phase two of GHG will be announced by them. We'll have some timeline around when that's going to need to be met. And, um, you know, I think what John mentioned is, is having the vertical. And I think a lot of the manufacturers are moving in that direction now. You know, with the, the costs involved of meeting these new regulation standards, to have the choice and variety in the options that they once had, whether it's from a powertrain, transmission, axle, um, aerodynamic features, um, those things are becoming more and more condensed simply because you don't have the ability to test all those different permutations and variations and to optimize around um, multiple different configurations is, is a challenge as well. So I think you, we see, uh, at least in our area of the business, which would be predominantly six through eight, there's a lot of that vertical integration efforts that are, that are ongoing as well. Real quick, John Blodgett, your outlook for the, the, the business? Yep. We see positive as well. I agree with Rich. Uh, I guess the only uh, concerns, uh, we subscribe to some of the industry services and the outlook and some of the, the, the orders that the fleets are putting out there, um, they're pacing them out, out over time which gives them the ability to cancel them if things slow down. So usually when you, you place an order, you do the majority of them in the first quarter and the second quarter. Some of those are being placed out longer. There's a, a company called FTR that does forecasts, and they've got some concerns as to why are they pacing them out that long? Is that, that going to be a problem down the road? But. Thanks for all that. I want to thank all three of you. John Rupert, Rich Shearing, John Blodgett, awesome for having you on here. I learned a lot, and I hope you learned a lot, too. Underwriting for the production of Auto Line this week has been provided by... Auto Line is brought to you in part by the commercial vehicle brands of Tenneco, pioneering global ideas for cleaner air and quieter, smoother, and safer transportation. Ford Warner, developing advanced technologies specifically aimed at reducing emissions, increasing fuel economy, and improving performance. Our award-winning innovations extend from turbocharging and cooling systems to friction materials and diesel cold start technology. Built on a century-long reputation of innovation and reliability, we have the track record that proves our technology can help meet the challenges of the commercial truck and off-highway industry. Deloitte's Automotive Group is at the forefront, driving transformation and tackling complex challenges. Whether you are interested in globalizing operations, optimizing supply chains, mitigating enterprise risk, or driving innovation, Deloitte can help develop solutions that create long-lasting value. To learn more about Deloitte's Automotive Group, visit us online at deloitte.com backslash US backslash automotive.